And as you're being seated, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5. We have made it to the ninth and final juicy fruit of the Spirit this morning. Galatians 5, God has been teaching us about the fruit of the Spirit He is producing in us as we walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. And so I want us to look real quick, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Paul kind of introduced us uh, to this teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. He said in verse 16, I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't Do what you want. Before God saved us by his grace through our faith in Christ Jesus, we were spiritually dead in our sins. We were separated from God by our sin against God, and we had no way of getting rid of our sin and getting to God on our own. We walked by the flesh. We were in charge of us. We did what we wanted, when we wanted the way we wanted. We were a mess, and we made a mess of our lives and relationships. Paul's list of the works of the flesh, we see beginning in verse 19, confirms this reality. When God saved us, he placed his Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He convicts us of our sin. He guides our steps. He encourages our faith. He teaches us God's word. He empowers us to follow God, not our flesh. As Paul said, when we walk by the Spirit, as we walk by the Spirit on a day-by-day basis, we will not carry out the desire of our flesh. As we walk by the Spirit on a day-by-day basis, we will grow in our faith in God. We will walk in obedience to God. We will see the power of God at work in, through, and around us on a daily basis. As we walk by the Spirit, we will point people to God. We will reap blessing after blessing after blessing from God. It is easy for us to understand. It's easy for us to see why Paul commanded us to walk by the Spirit. It's very easy to see this reality, both in the Word, and the testimony of the Word, but also the testimony of our lives. So our daily challenge, your daily challenge, my daily challenge, is one and the same as followers of Jesus Christ, no matter our age or stage in life. Our daily challenge is to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. And so we come now to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, and Paul writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such Things. So we look this morning now at self-control. Self-control in the original language comes from kratea, in kratea. And it means temperance, it means sober-mindedness. It actually comes from the root word kratas, which means power, control, and might. And so when you take kratas and you add it to preposition in, you get the combination in power, or in control. Self-control is therefore the power to control, harness, and restrain the desires, lusts, and urges of our flesh. Self-control, this fruit of self-control, is the power to control, harness, and restrain the sinful desires, lusts, and urges of our flesh. Key point, you know this as well as I do, this power is not from us. It's by God's Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit in us is the one who empowers us 
to control, harness, and restrain the desires, urges, and the lusts of our flesh. Through our faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within us. As we walk by the Spirit, he produces self-control, this power that we so desperately need that enables us to control, to restrain those desires, those lusts, those longings, those urges that are part of our flesh. We cannot, we cannot produce self-control in our power and wisdom. We cannot control, harness, or restrain our flesh in our strength and wisdom. It will not happen because it cannot happen. Paul told us about this. He made it clear in Romans 7, verse 18. Paul said, for I know there is nothing good that lives in me that is in my flesh. For the desire To do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. Now, that's what I call an honest and accurate assessment. You want honesty? You want the real truth from God's word? There it is. There's nothing good that lives in me that is in my flesh. I know. I have the desire to do what is good. It's it's with me. But I have no ability to do it. We cannot control our flesh in our power and wisdom. It reminds me of the story of this salesman who was eager. He was uh, in the final processes of trying to win this massive bid for his company, Uh, He was meeting with this manager, the engineering firm, that they were placing this bid before the the competition had come down to two companies, and this salesman was super eager. And he was in the the office meeting with the manager of this engineering firm that was going to make a decision as to whether they went with his company or a a competitor company. And uh, so he was there meeting with this manager to present his company's final bid. And as he was in the meeting, uh, the meeting was stopped because the manager had to leave the office for a few moments. And so as the manager left, the office, this eager salesman was sitting there and he happened to look up on the manager's desk and he noticed on the manager's desk was the competitor, the other firm, the competitor's bid was sitting on the manager's desk right there. And he kind of looked from where he was sitting to see if he could see uh, the bid, the final bid at the bottom of uh, the page, but he couldn't read it because there was a large can that was sitting on the desk of the manager that was actually sitting on the bid, and it was covering that part of the bid, which revealed their bottom line, their offer uh, for this uh, massive deal. And so he sat there and looked at the door. No one was coming. The manager hadn't come back. And so temptation was too great. He couldn't control himself. And so he leaned up. And he lifted the can to see what the other competitor's bid was. And as he did, his heart sank. As horrifyingly, he watched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of BBs spill out all over the desk and onto the floor that was in the bottomless can that he had lifted up. We have no ability to produce self-control in our wisdom and our strength. We exercise self-control as we walk by the Spirit. So real quick, the the sermon in a sentence, real quick, if you want to jot this down, we are self-controlled only as we are Spirit-controlled. We are self-controlled only as we are spirit-controlled. The fruit of self-control is supernatural. It's not from us, it's from God, and it's in us, for us, and through us by faith in Jesus. We are self-controlled only as we are spirit-controlled day by day. Now, quick other note, background, it's the tie that will tie us a little bit to what Paul was dealing with, to what we're dealing with today, because there's not much uh, you'll notice here in just a moment that's changed. In Paul's day, Paul lived in a 
sex-crazed and sex-focused world. And many of the believers in the churches where Paul ministered, where he, uh, the churches he planted, uh, many of the churches that he wrote these letters to, in particular, uh, the letter we're studying now, and other letters in the New Testament where he sent these letters, where he went on his travels to teach and to encourage and to disciple these believers. Many of the believers in these local churches that we read about in the New Testament were saved out of this type of lifestyle. And so much of what is written, especially in the New Testament, and a lot of times where Paul focused his attention when he talked about the fruit of self-control, it was focused specifically on the area of sexuality. And controlling the, the, the fruit of self-control helps us to control those, those desires, lusts, longings, and, and urges of uh, the flesh as it relates to sexuality. Now, as you know, not much has changed from Paul's day to our day. We live in a sex-crazed, sex-focused, sex-confused culture today. So certainly the fruit of self-control helps us as it relates to our sexuality. But the fruit of self-control also helps us as it relates to every area of our life. Our sexuality, our appetite for food and drink, our pursuit of money, our pursuit of power, our pursuit of pleasure, our pursuit of people's praise. The fruit of self-control helps us with our pride, the battle we have with our pride, with our temper, with our words, with our thoughts, with our feelings in every area of our lives. This fruit of self-control encompasses every area of our life. God uses this fruit of self-control to help us. So whatever the area, the specific area where you seem to have the biggest, strongest, most intense battle as it comes to the desires, urges, and longings and lusts of your flesh, this fruit of self-control is going to help. It will help you to control and to harness and to restrain those desires and those urges as it relates to that particular area that maybe you struggle with more than others, but it'll certainly relate to all kinds of different areas that are a struggle and temptation for us as we seek to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh as followers of Jesus Christ. Solomon talked about this in Proverbs 25 and verse 28. Solomon said, a person who does not control his temper is... uh, is unwise, and it's like a city whose wall is broken down. The person who doesn't control his temper is like a city whose wall is broken down. What does that mean? It means this, without self-control, we are vulnerable. Walls were put up around cities to protect the cities from invaders. And when a wall was broken down, the city was vulnerable to outside attack. And so like a person who doesn't control their temper, It's like a city's wall is broken down. That means for us as followers of Jesus Christ, without this fruit of self-control, we're vulnerable. We're wide open to the attacks of our enemy. There's lies, accusations, temptations that are designed to discourage us, to divide us, and ultimately to devour us. And so we can rejoice today that God produces his fruit of self-control in us. And I think we can all agree we desperately need this fruit active in our lives as we walk by the Spirit. So let's look at a couple of points about this fruit, and then we'll look at applying it in our lives uh, today and this week. First point, as we've seen in many of these uh, fruit of the Spirit study through our study, is Jesus perfectly displayed self-control. In his earthly ministry, Jesus was the perfect model and example uh, of each fruit of the Spirit. With each fruit of the Spirit, Jesus was the incarnation uh, of God in the flesh. He was the perfect example. He perfectly displayed each fruit of the Spirit, and he perfectly displayed in his earthly ministry the fruit of self-control. As you think about it, Jesus demonstrated self-control as he communicated and dealt with the temptation from Satan in the wilderness after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he resisted those temptations. Jesus demonstrated self-control in his communication with the Jewish religious leaders, rabbis, and Pharisees who constantly opposed him, ridiculed him, and argued with him. Jesus demonstrated self-control with his disciples and followers as he taught them that he was the promised Messiah who the Old Testament spoke of who was to come. He was the Son of God, God the Son. Jesus demonstrated self-control with his disciples and followers as they deserted and denied him as he went to the cross to pay 
the price for their sins and our sins. Jesus demonstrated self-control with those who falsely accused him, beat him, ridiculed him, and spit on him. Jesus demonstrated self-control as he took our place on the cross and paid our price for sins by sacrificing his very life for us on the cross of Calvary. Jesus perfectly displayed and demonstrated this fruit of self-control. And he is our example, our model to follow. As followers of Christ, we're to walk as Jesus walked. So we walk as Jesus walked. We demonstrate this fruit of self-control as we walk by the Spirit. So any point in time, if you want an example, if you want to see a a good model of self-control, look to the Word, look to the Gospels, look to Jesus Christ, and you'll see this fruit, as well as the others, uh, on perfect display in and through his earthly life and ministry. The second point then is we know God wants self-control through us. This is obvious. God wants self-control through us. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. God produces in us as we walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. Please understand and remember this point. We've been talking about it. And it's very simple. We don't display the fruit of the Spirit without a fight. We don't display the fruit of the Spirit without a fight. Our flesh and the Holy Spirit are in a battle, a spiritual tug of war in us for control of us. We know this. That's what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 and 17. There's a spiritual tug of war going on within each of us as followers of Jesus Christ on a day-by-day basis. And that tug of war is the enemy's trying to get us to walk in the flesh and the spirit is leading us and drawing us to walk his way. And there's this tug of war that's going on. Peter understood this as well as Paul. And Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Peter said, man, there's a war going on in each one of us. So abstain from those desires, those sinful desires of the flesh. Abstain. Because they are Desires that are going to lead you against the Spirit. They're working against the Spirit. They're in opposition to the Spirit. That's exactly what Paul was talking about here in Galatians chapter 5. Peter told us in his first letter, in 1 Peter, you'll notice in chapter 1, in chapter 4, and in chapter 5. Three different occasions, Peter called on us to be sober-minded, which that can also be translated self-controlled. And so over and over again, Peter reminded us of this need for self-control. Paul shared this with us. There's great agreement throughout the New Testament, throughout the Word of God. Peter told us, be sober-minded, be self-controlled so that you can obey God, so that you can pray to God. And then the third use was so that you can be alert and ready for spiritual warfare. Peter was clear. He was clear with us. He said, listen, guys, abstain, abstain from those sinful desires that that rage inside. So the fruit of self-control is the power from God, his Holy Spirit in us, that enables us to abstain from those sinful desires. It enables us to restrain the desires of, lusts of our flesh. Why? So that God's work can continue in and through us. There's a restraining and there's also a freeing. And we're going to talk more about the freeing aspect of self-control in a few moments. And so we see these key points. God wants self-control through you and through me. Now, I think it's quite humorous at points. I think it's also obviously God's divine Uh, timing that we're getting ready to go into Christmas, and he's teaching us about self-control. So take that message however you see fit. There is a purpose for us to be here as we head into Christmas and spending time with family and all that's going to happen. Self-control is a must for us. Let's look at two relatives of self-control that we see in the scriptures that help us to apply this fruit in our lives. One is from Peter and one is from Paul. These guys agree again, and so we'll look at one from Peter, one from Paul. First is from Peter, and that is knowledge. 
Peter emphasized the importance of knowledge as it related to self-control. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter uh, said in verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge. Say that with me out loud. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace, peace, and all God's blessings are multiplied to us as we increase our knowledge of God and his word. This means our blessings, our spiritual growth, the fruit of the Spirit increases in us as our knowledge of God increases. Quick reminder, we know God because God chose to reveal himself to us in his creation, in his word, and in his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Peter here, at the beginning of 2 Peter chapter 1, he's telling us about all these blessings that increase as our knowledge of God increases. This is what Peter said in verses 3 and 4, summarizing as we get to verse 5. He said that through our knowledge of God and the divine power that we have from God, we have everything we need to live for God. From our knowledge of God and the divine power that we have from God at work in us, we have everything we need, the knowledge and the power the will and to work. We have everything we need to live for God. And he continued in verse five, and I want you to see the connection here. He said, for this very reason, since we have everything we need to live for God, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control. Say that with me out loud. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Peter connected knowledge with self-control. Self-control grows in us as our knowledge of God and his word increases. As our knowledge of God and his word increases, our understanding of the fruit of the Spirit increases. And therefore, this fruit of self-control has more and more freedom in our lives to be displayed through our lives. Self-control helps us to walk in obedience to God. Self-control helps us to endure in our faith in God. Self-control helps us to restrain the desires of our flesh. And Peter here connected knowledge with self-control. And so we know the more time we spend with God and his word, the better. Because as you've seen, I'm sure, in your life, I know I've seen in my life, the more I know about God and his word, the more I can joyfully display the fruit of self-control, the more that fruit of self-control will be displayed through me because I know that I know that I know that God's in control. He knows what he's doing, and therefore I can rest, I can trust. I can hold on to him. I don't have to stress. I don't have to freak out. I don't have to take matters into my own hands. I don't have to fix everyone. I don't have to fix every situation. No, 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 no. As my knowledge of God and his word grows, I long to walk by the spirit. As I walk by the spirit, the spirit produces his fruit in my life, in particular, the fruit of self-control. And that fruit of self-control continues to grow as I spend time in the word. And that fruit of self-control then helps me to restrain my flesh when something happens, when someone says something to me, when a circumstance happens, when I am tempted to stress or to freak out. No, 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 that self-control grabs a hold and restraints because I'm reminded, no, 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 not going to do that. God's got that. He's in control. All things work together for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. There's no condemnation for me any longer because I'm in Christ Jesus. No one or nothing can separate me from the love that God has for me in Christ Jesus. God's going to meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God will make all grace abound to me so that at all times in every way, having all that I need, I'll be able to abound in every good work. I'm good. God's in control. It means I can rest. God's in control. It means I can rejoice. God's in control. It means I can just watch to see how he works this out. God's in control, so that means I can wait. I can wait because his timing is perfect. Because it's based on his will, which is best for us. 
And so this knowledge, Peter connected knowledge with self-control. Now Paul, the second relative we see, Paul connected discipline with self-control. Paul went in a little bit different direction. Interesting. Paul, in his first letter to the believers at church in Corinth, used an athletic analogy, an athletic illustration to explain his purpose and his calling, which was to bring glory to God by helping others come to know Jesus and grow in Jesus. And so he used this athletic analogy. The believers of the church in Corinth would have understood this analogy because sports, athletics was a huge part of the culture in Corinth. Corinth was a location for the Isthmian Games, which were held in between the Olympic Games every uh, two years, the biennial uh, games that would be held between the Olympic Games at this time. And so Paul here is using this illustration. First Corinthians chapter 9, Paul writes these words beginning in verse 24. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way as to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. They do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Paul here sets the analogy up. He says, hey, listen, all the runners in the race run to win the prize. And therefore, they all exercise self-control as they're preparing to run the race, as they're preparing to enter the competition. They all exercise self-control. It would be ignorant for an athlete not to exercise self-control. So therefore, they say no to everything and anything that would hinder them from performing at their best, at their peak in that particular race or competition. So they exercise self-control. They're saying no to the things they need to say no to, the foods they need to say no to. The activities they say need to say no to because they want to perform at their best. They don't want anything to hinder them in performing at their best. Why? Because they want to win the race. They're doing this because they're pursuing a perishable, Paul said, a perishable temporary crown. Paul's day was a, a wreath that would be placed around uh, the head of the victor. In contrast, Paul then said to these believers and to you and me this morning, he said, as followers of Jesus Christ, we run the race of the Christian life and we are running the race of the Christian life because we're pursuing an imperishable eternal crown. We are running the race of the Christian life each day for the glory of our almighty God. As we help others come to know Jesus and grow in Jesus, because we're all, hopefully one day, all those who come to faith in Christ are going to join with us, and we're going to spend eternity with Jesus. And so Paul here is using this analogy, and he continues, and he says in verse 26, So I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline. Say that with me out loud. I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul connected self-control with discipline. Peter, self-control with knowledge. Paul, self-control with discipline. They all go together. What Paul is saying is since we are seeking to please God, since we are seeking to bring glory and honor to God, since we have eternity in mind, since time with God increases our knowledge of God and his word, since time with God helps us to walk by the Spirit, since time with God and his word increases our knowledge and helps us to display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, therefore we must discipline ourselves, Paul is saying. We must discipline ourselves to seek God first, to spend time with God, to walk surrender to God so that nothing in our lives will disqualify or hinder us from bringing glory to God as we seek to fulfill our calling and purpose from God, which is to help others come to know Jesus and grow in Jesus. So he's helping us understand this self-control, this fruit of self-control, it is increased in us. As Peter said, because of our knowledge. And, and so we need to increase our knowledge. That means to get into the Word. This Word helps us. The more we know about God, the more this, this, this desire is for us to walk by the Spirit, which displays, the Holy Spirit displays this fruit of self-control through us. And then also the discipline. Why wouldn't we discipline ourselves? If we know knowledge happens through our time of the Word, yes, we're going to discipline ourselves on a day-by-day -day basis. 
So through our discipline in the Word, the fruit of the Spirit is born in our lives. We're able to glorify God as we walk by the Spirit and not the flesh, as we demonstrate self-control. That way, nothing in our lives is going to hinder or disqualify us from our purpose and calling. When others around us who are watching to see if this real Jesus does make a difference in us and a circumstance happens or someone comes against us and we're walking by the Spirit, we're able by the power of the Spirit at work in us through the fruit of self-control. We don't respond like others respond. No, we respond and self-control allows us to harness, to control, to restrain our urge, which is to come right back at them and to come at them in kind with what they've come at with us. That helps others around us who are watching to see if Jesus really makes a difference. They're able to see, whoa, whoa. Ah, that person's different. I can't believe they didn't come firing back at that individual. How, how did you do that? How did you return their fire with your love and grace? And we're able to understand and realize, okay, it's this fruit of self-control that's in there that's, that's, that's working. And so knowledge, discipline, help. So what's our application today? It's walk by the Spirit as it is with each of these. Walk by the Spirit as we depend on God, as we walk in surrender to God and obedience to God. The Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and He empowers the fruit of the Spirit to be displayed through our lives so that those around us are blessed. And so as we walk by the Spirit, we are able to exercise and demonstrate, we're able to display the fruit of self-control. Now, as you, I'm sure, have already processed through your mind, through our time of study, through the juicy fruit of the Spirit, I'm sure you would agree, it makes perfect sense that God would inspire Paul to end this list of the fruit of the Spirit with this fruit of self-control. makes perfect sense. As he's gone through all the other fruit of the Spirit, he comes to the end, and he ends it with self-control. Self-control is the power that we have in us by the Holy Spirit to control, harness, and restrain the desires, the lusts, the longings, the urges of our flesh. Self-control, the fruit of self-control, also, as it allows us to restrain those urges, it, at the very same point in time, frees us to demonstrate the other fruit of the Spirit to those around us through our words and our actions. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to speak and show love. God's agape love. His always giving and giving and giving love to those around us in our words and in our actions. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to show this love to those who are unloving towards us. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to be joyful at all times. The good times and the bad times, the challenges and the difficulties, when things are going our way, when things aren't going our way, when we like what's happening, when we don't like what's happening. Because, you know, we are well aware that we are right with God in Christ Jesus. And so we can consider it great joy whenever we face trials, challenges, troubles, sufferings, trials, tribulations. Because we know God's at work in us. He's doing his work through us. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to live at peace and harmony with God through continually confessing our sins to him and with those around us. As we seek to do our part to live at peace with those around us, the fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and it frees us 
to show patience to others who may be impatient with us. It frees us to be patient and to wait on God and to wait with God as he works in us, as he works in others, as he works around us to allow his purposes to be fulfilled for us. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to be kind and caring to those around us in our words and actions. Whether they are kind and caring to us, it frees us to respond in a kind, caring way to them. The fruit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to show the fruit of goodness, to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason, because our God is a good God. Our God is a good, good Father, and we desire and long to show that fruit of goodness by His power at work in and through us. The, spirit of, the fruit of the Spirit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to show faithfulness, dependability, reliability, trustworthiness in all of our words and actions and in our interactions with those around us. It frees us to be men and women of our word, reflecting on God's faithfulness to us and allowing that faithfulness to show through us. And the fruit of the spirit of self-control restrains our flesh and frees us to be gentle, tender, gracious, considerate of others. In our words and our actions it helps us to be gentle in our tone. It helps us to be gentle with our volume. It helps us to be gentle in our responses to those around us. We are self-controlled only as we are spirit controlled. And the Holy Spirit restrains us through this fruit of self-control. So at the same time, frees us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those he places around us. So once again, our challenge is the same. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And as we've walked through this series, a few points that help us walk by the Spirit, just a few points of application that we've seen in each one of the fruit that we have listed. The first is admit our weakness. We can't Walk by the Spirit in our strength. We've made that clear through this study. The second is ask for God's forgiveness. We've got to ask for His forgiveness. We've got to make sure that, that we are continuing that sweet fellowship that we have with the Father, confessing our sins, knowing He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. A third application is just to depend on God. We've we got to depend on Him. That's what walking by the Spirit means. It literally means depending on God, throwing ourselves completely upon Him and then doing what he says. Just simply, in his power, walking by the Spirit, walking in obedience to the Word. The more we grow in our faith, the more we display God's fruit. As we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desires of our flesh. Instead, we will be able to display the power of all the fruit of the Spirit in and through our lives, to those around us. As Charles Spurgeon once said, those who are much with Christ become much like Christ. We become much like Christ as we walk by the Spirit. We ask you to bow in prayer. Our worship team is going to come and lead in this time of response. And I want to encourage you just to spend this time with the Father. Here in person, streaming online, just take these moments to respond as the Lord's leading you. The altar is open here as it always is for you to come and kneel and do business with the Father. Our pastors, our ministers will be standing here at the front. They would love to pray with you, pray for you. If you have a need, care, concern, they would love to, to pray with you, to be able to bless you, pray over you. Allow the Holy Spirit to search you and to to point out those areas in your life that he is longing for you to continue to yield. Maybe those steps he wants you to take. Maybe that person he wants you to minister to. Maybe the Lord has convicted you in an area 
or he wants you to release to him. Maybe it's an area that that you've been struggling with recently. So the Lord spoke to you and you wanted to pray and ask God just to to unleash this self-control, his power in this one area to help you in that area that you tend to struggle with more than others. God is speaking. He longs for us to respond in obedience to him. If you've never received God's gift of salvation, or place your faith in Jesus, I would encourage you to make that decision because until that decision is made, you're incapable of walking by the Spirit because you're still separated from God because you're sitting against God. All you can do is to walk by the flesh. And things aren't going to work out the way you want them to when you walk by the flesh. Everything changes when you receive God's gift of salvation. By your faith and trust in Jesus, He places the Holy Spirit in you, and then you begin to understand the reality of the Christian life that Jesus does make a difference, that there is power, and that you can display this fruit in and through his power at work in your life. Our pastors, our ministers would love to introduce you to Jesus as well this morning. God is at work. Let's respond to him. Let's stand in worship and obedience to him.